Good morning. You've got all the information. You know what's taking place in your bulletin. We are on a, the second week of an eight-week part dealing with how to make Christ first in your life, how to move him into a priority position. In the busyness of our lives, there are so many things that seem to take a first-place spot. I was out cleaning my garage yesterday, like many of you. Perhaps your garage is overwhelming or you have a closet space somewhere that just seems too much to overcome. Inside my garage, I, am, I need to evolve to have another set of arms. But I have an arm here trying to move some stuff. I have an arm here trying to move stuff. And I'm trying to balance a, a six-foot table that's ready to fall on top of me. And I know I have room, but I want everything put in its spot all at once. I've got to prioritize all of my stuff so I can get it in there. I've got to prioritize my stuff so that what's important is really in the right spot. Because when I don't and then someone opens the garage door, <laughs> when I invite you to come to my house and I lead you through my garage, take the front door. It's a trap. It is imperative for us to make Christ first. And so today, we are going to look at just that. How do I make Christ the priority of my life? How do you make Christ the priority of your life? When Paul writes to the Colossians, remember, he did not know these people. He had never seen them. And he writes, I didn't see you face to face. But he knows some of the people that are here. He knows the pastor of the church. He knows the house church, Philemon. He knows where they're meeting. As a matter of fact, he also knows one of the attendants of the church by the name of Onesimus, a runaway slave who has been returned. So Paul knows some of the characteristics, some of the people of the church, although he's never been there himself. It is amazing that the Word of God can work in people's lives without an apostle being there to guide and direct. What does that mean for you and I? It means that the Word of God that was written, the New Testament, almost 2,000 years ago, is still valuable, still has authority for your life and my life today. It can help you by putting Christ in the first spot. And I dare say that most of us are struggling with that desperately in our daily lives. We want to move from lip service to actual service. Will you join me as we pray? Let me follow. We thank you for our time together. Lord, we have gathered together so that we might come to know you better. Our goal is not to come to church and to be emotionally encouraged to be puffed up, to move out, and say, wow, I feel so good about myself, or I feel so good about you. We want to be transformed. We want our lives to be different. We want to be equipped so that we might go out throughout the rest of our week and be used by you, recognizing that you are to have the first priority of all things. This morning we ask that the busyness of life would be removed from us, that our thoughts would be solely directed towards what your word has to say. Help us discern what's true and what's not true. Help us to apply these great truths that we find in your word to each of our own lives, that we might bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Inside your bulletin, you have a, a holdout, a foldout, a tear out. There are many blanks in there for you. Please grab that. You will need that as we begin. Because as the question begins in Colossians chapter 1, 9 verse, uh, uh, verse 9 through 14, we are in the middle of a prayer. Verse 9 through 14 is one sentence, just like verse 3 through 8 is one sentence. And when he starts in verse 9, he says, For this reason, or because of this, because of what? Our attention is brought back to verse 3. Paul says, We give thanks to God 
and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it has also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Paul says, I'm giving thanks to the Lord God because I heard about your faith. It has gone out and people know that you are believers in Jesus Christ. The grace of God has come and it has transformed you. I have not seen this, but I have heard. It's having an impact. As a matter of fact, I have a witness here by the name of Epaphras. You know him. He is a fellow minister and he's declaring to me how you have changed. Throughout the rest of the book, we'll find how the Colossians have changed, how they have, moved, they have passed from death to life. And Paul's challenge to them to put off the old and to put on the new. That is what the Christian life looks like. The old is thrown away and the new is put on so it might live in glory to God. And he says in verse 9, For this reason, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease. We have not stopped praying for you. That does not mean that they have, they have sequestered themselves in a little room and they are praying nonstop. It means that whenever something comes to their mind, like Mel illustrated, hey, I'm going to pray for them. And Epaphras is there pouring out his heart to the Apostle Paul saying, Brother Paul, I have come to you from Colossae because there is a problem. A new idea has come about that people can know more about God, a deeper feeling of God, a deeper sense of God. And they are saying that what I've taught them about the gospel is really only the first stage. And they have a deeper stage, something more. And people are listening. They're hearing this and saying, yeah, I want to know more. I want to know the secret knowledge the secret mysteries of God. And there's teachers who are running around saying, we know this, and if you come with us, we will teach you those secret mysteries. How do I combat this? What do I do? Paul says, I'll tell you what you do. You go back there and you teach him Jesus Christ. You talk about his person and his work. And that's what he does in the first two chapters. That's what he focuses on in the first two chapters. And then the last two chapters, he says, here's how you work it out in your life. Here's how you apply the personal work of Christ in your life. It's all about making Christ first. And how do we do that? It begins with knowledge, your first fill-in. Making Christ first in your life begins with the knowledge of God's will. In verse 9, he says, for, the re for this reason also, since the day, or because of the day we heard of it, we did not cease praying for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. How does one learn about God's will? He listens to God's word. There is no other source to find out about God's will than through his word. When God speaks, he declares to us, what he wants us to know in regards to a particular matter. When we open up God's word, it declares to us what his will is. We know this to be true as we spend any time in the word of God. I remind you, there was a little garden on the east side of Eden. And in this little garden, there was a couple that was placed there. You know them as mother and father of all creation. Adam and Eve. They knew God's will because God spoke to them and said, Ah, I've established all the trees and bushes for you to eat, except for one, the tree of good and evil. Don't eat of that one. They knew God's will of everything that they were to eat. 
Where were they to get food? They never had to go to God and say, Lord, is this apple tree good? Is it okay for me to eat? Do I need to get permission? They knew God's will in matters of what to eat. When they saw a cow, they did not think, hamburger and steak. Sounds good to me. God already said, no, the nut trees, the fruit trees, the berry trees, all this is for you, for you to eat. They knew God's will. They did not have to ask. They did not have to inquire. They did not have to seek. It was already there for them. Yet, they had trouble obeying God's will. You see, the knowledge of God's will is to have a controlling factor of us. It's in verse 9, he says, that you would be filled. The idea is not like a cup that's empty, and that if we just increase our knowledge of God, pretty soon our cup will runneth over. Then if I just become more head smart, if I just memorize more, then I will acquire more and more knowledge, and I will know knowledge puff us up. The idea that, and that is used here of Paul, it says that you may be filled. And when he uses this word filled, it has the idea of controlling. Let me put it to you this way. We are praying and asking that you might be controlled with the knowledge of his will. Knowledge without control does not offer much value. When he speaks to the Ephesians and he says, don't be drunk with wine, but be controlled by the Spirit. But be ye filled. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. If you're under the influence of alcohol, you tend not to make proper decisions in life. You tend to do and say things that you probably shouldn't or you wouldn't say. As a matter of fact, most of our states in the country have has made it a law that if you operate any type of automobile and had a drink, had a swig, they say that your judgment is impaired to operate that. Interesting. Yet, the Christian life is to be filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit so that it permeates throughout our life. One who is controlled by the Spirit walks in a certain manner, is controlled in a certain manner, understands the will of God. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Keep your hand in Colossians. We're going to go right back to there. But since we just finished with Thessalonians, I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because these great Christians who were on fire for the Lord, the Apostle Paul says to them in chapter 4, he says, Finally, brethren, we urge you and exhort you in the Lord, Jesus, that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verse 3. For this is the will of God. The will of God is known by spending time in the Word of God. There is no gray area when it comes to the will of God. The things that he's revealed to us are things that he wants us to know. And in this area, he says, this is your sanctification, that you are set apart, that you are holy. You are not to be used for common things, but you are to be used for God, for his holy purpose, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That is God's will for the saint. That is God's will for you and me. Sometimes, no, all the time. We are to be controlled by this knowledge. So in Sunday school class, when we, we talked about King David being in the wrong spot at the wrong time in his sin with Bathsheba, we must be controlled by the Holy Spirit, by the will of God. When the situation comes up, we say, no, I want nothing to do with that, and we flee like Joseph fled. Knowledge is to change us. We begin with the knowledge of God's will by having spiritual wisdom, by having spiritual understanding. What is spiritual wisdom? Wisdom begins with fear of the Lord. That is the beginning of knowledge. That's what Proverbs 1 7 talks about. Right knowledge always leads to right behavior, but it doesn't guarantee it. 
spiritual wisdom is understanding spiritual things. Oftentimes we think that that's somehow the immaterial. Something we can't touch, we can't feel, we can't grasp. But Paul writes to the, Col or to the Colossians and more specifically to the Corinthians in chapter 2. And turn with me there because it's important for us to see that. Go, go left in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You went to Romans, you went too far. In verse 6, he says, Now we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Chapter 2, verse 6. Now we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God has ordained before the ages of our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it's written, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God, for what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the unsaved man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What Paul is basically saying to summarize this whole thing is, we who have believed in Christ understand spiritual things. We understand the spiritual wisdom of God because we have been transformed. We have been made new. So when God speaks of spiritual things in heaven, we say, I understand that. I get that. You mean when I die, I am going to heaven. I believe that. I trust that because his word declares it. It's true. When you speak that to the unsaved, they say, what foolishness is that? You're telling me that God came down and took on the form of man and dwelt among man, died on the cross, and then rose again from the dead? Who believes that? Is that out of Grimm's fairy tales? Is that out of Mother Goose? Who believes that type of thing? Ask our leading professors in our major universities. It is foolishness. But to us, it is life. It is the knowledge of God. It is spiritual wisdom. And we hear the truth from God's word. And we, we recognize it. Then we apply it. Also by having spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding here is insight, discernment. The author of Hebrew, Hebrews writes to the Hebrews in chapter 5 in a warning passage. And he says, but it is time that you should be teachers. But instead, you have to go back to the basics. You should be moving on to the spiritual meat. You should be having spiritual steak. But instead, <coughs> it's time for you to be drinking out of baby bottles again. You have not matured. You have not discerned. We have to go back and reteach the basics. Spiritual discernment allows you to discern what's truth and what's false. Ecclesiastes 8.5 says, A wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. We are wise. We seek after these things. And it begins with knowledge of God's will. 
And once we have the knowledge of God, it doesn't end there. It spreads. It spreads to pleasing behavior in verse 10. Once we know God's will, it doesn't say, okay, I got God's will. Now what do I do? I know what God wants for my life. Great. Now, the prayer that Paul moves on to the Colossians, here's what changes. Here's what takes place. In verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. That you may walk worthy. There is no separation between learning and living in the Christian life. Living provides an opportunity for education, and education provides the opportunity for practice. We are to live in a way that pleases the Lord. The idea of worthy means that we are to live in such a manner, in such a manner that shows honor and glory to God. How does that work out? It is your life is to balance out the character of Jesus Christ. That pleases God. So we have the character, the works of Jesus. And he says, I've given you this life. Now, walk in a way that shows there's balance, that you're equal to it. I've given you something new. Now walk in a way that demonstrates that, that demonstrates my character, that demonstrates my new life that I've given to you. Walk in a way that when I see you, I smile, that I am pleased, that I brag and I boast about you, like my servant Job. Recall that when Satan, it was God who came to Satan and said, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in all the earth. There is none that turns from evil and it's who does what's right. Job is a great servant of the Lord. And when he is tested, he is found out to honor the Lord and God is elevated and praised by the life of Job. His, whole family, his wife says, just curse God and die. His friends say, you must have sinned because bad things like this don't happen to good people. You must have done something. You ever thought something bad. You did something bad when you were a child. You did a sin that you didn't know about it. You just, all these bad things have happened to you must be because of something you did. Job says, no, I didn't do anything. God says, your life is in balance. It's worthy. It's pleasing to me. Ephesians 4 talks about our, our walk is to be worthy of God. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, talks about the same thing. I already read chapter 4, verse 1. Our life is to walk being worthy. The quality of our life is to reflect Jesus Christ. We are to make him proud of us. Christ pleased the Father in the way that he lived and in his obedience. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Don't look at your mom and dad. This is well-pleasing to God. It might make your mom and dad happy, but this is pleasing to God. You want to please God? You want to walk in a way where God says, that's right. That's right, my son. That's right, my daughter. You are walking in balance and worthy of my name and worthy of the things that I've given to you. Colossians says, when you are in obedience to your parents, that's pleasing to me. Philippians chapter 4. Go to Philippians. Go to school left the book. 4.18. Indeed, I have abounded, and I am full, having received from Epaphroditus all things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to the Lord. Paul saying, I received the spiritual gift, the, the financial support that you sent, the sacrifice that you gave. It is well-pleasing to the Lord. As I will take this and use this for furtherance of the ministry. That is well-pleasing. God is pleased by your giving. These are just two examples, and there are many other examples that please the Lord. Knowing God's will translates into our behavior. It spreads to pleasing God. 
Third thing, when we are pleasing God, this leads to good works. Third fill in. Verse 10, back to Colossians chapter 1. The pleasing behavior leads to good works. What are the good works that we find here? Paul says, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, strengthened with all might. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. So these four works that we see here, bearing fruit, growing, or perhaps your Bible says increasing. Third one, strengthened or empowered. The last one, giving thanks. Let me just start with the first one, bearing fruit. Paul uses this idea, this figure of a tree here, and that's what we have, is we have the trunk. The trunk, if you will, is, or excuse me, the root is knowledge. We start with the deep knowledge of God that is sunk deep into the ground, and that knowledge springs up into a life, the trunk, the walk. And, of course, that branches out into multiple branches everywhere. And those are the different works. And on the end of the branches, what do we see? We see the fruit of that. Now, what produces the fruit? The knowledge, the life, through the works, and we have fruit. The fruit is good works. It should come natural to Christians to have good works. What type of good works will I bear? There's a variety of good works that will come out of there, that will come from you. But it's not just a one-time event, it's a continuation. These fruits are to come time and time again. These works are to come because if you take the picture of, of the tree, the root is down deep. And it's filled with the knowledge of God. The trunk is the life. It's your walk. And the walk is to reflect Christ. And the branches are the work. The natural examples of Christ living through you and in you. Paul says in Colossians, says, this is the great mystery. Christ in you. Christ in you. This is just the opposite of Ephesians where he says, you are in Christ. In Ephesians, he's talking about your position, your placement. That when God sees you, he sees you through Christ. He changes that in Colossians. He says, no, people are seeing Christ through you. And so throughout the book and through your life, Christ is seen, or Christ is seen through your living, through your actions, through your conduct, through your words, through everything that you do. And so he, see, he focuses on set your mind where Christ is. And he says, hey, take off the old clothes and leave them to the side. Go over here and get these new clothes and put them on because you're the new man and the new man wears new threads or new ladies. And he wears these new, these new garments because they don't show how great a person I am. They show Christ is in you. And while Christ is being seen through you, fruit is being shown and seen. And these fruits are good works. Second thing, you are growing. You are increasing in the knowledge of God. It's an outward dissemination of truth. It's not that you are intellectually taking it in. It is the idea that you are increasing and pushing it out. The greatest thing that you can do for another person is the same thing that Andrew did for Peter. I know you're thinking back going, what did Andrew do for Peter? We found the Messiah. Let me show you where he's at. He brings him, and Peter meets the Messiah. The greatest thing that you and I can do is say, I know the Messiah. Let me tell you about him. He's right over here. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Hey, the whole book of 1 Thessalonians is filled with that. What did the Thessalonians do? They spread the gospel through their entire area, Achaia and Macedonia, that everyone knew that Jesus Christ was their first priority. And they loved the people so much that Christ was the most important thing that they shared and communicated with them. The fourth work that we see in verse 11, he says, strengthen with all might. 
or with all power. When God gives you strength, he gives you strength like the strength of himself. God doesn't give you the strength to overcome with the strength of man. God gives men strength, the strength of the divine. For example, Samson. When you go back and you read through all the things that Samson did, how was Samson able to do these things? He was supernaturally empowered. He was supernaturally strengthened. To grab a lion and to open him up like this, you can't go to one of the muscle magazines and see these great guys with muscles on top of muscles, and they cannot do the things that Samson did. They cannot take an animal and go, and tear him open. The physical human body is not strong enough to do that. Samson was strong enough to do that. Because God had given him the power to do just that. David. Was David powerful enough to take on the giant in and of himself? No. But he was given the power of God to do that. He was given the strength to face a giant. So here, Paul's prayer is that you might be empowered with the strength according to God's glorious power. For what two reasons? For all patience and for all long suffering. The idea of, of patience or is it the idea of endurance, the ability to hold on, to keep going when there is no hope. When you feel like there's no end in sight, but you keep going. Like those who are involved in marathons, and there becomes a time after, I don't know, it's the 11th or 10th, mi 11th or 13th, 14th mile, where it is really no longer a physical thing, it's all a mental, that they are just pushing themselves to get to the end. They are holding on to the end. That we find out toward what about what about the very what about pain, what about um, long suffering? Long suffering is the quality of God. Long suffering is the idea to be able to put up with, to bear with others, even when they are cynical or hostile towards you. Such long suffering is a godlike attribute. Don't be surprised if Christians are cynical with you or even hostile toward you. Other Christians, yes. Wrong? Yep. But weren't we towards Christ also? Yeah. But we are, according to Colossians 3.12, we are to put on the new clothes, long-suffering. We are to put this on. You say, but they're still mean to me. Put it on. The new man has the attributes of God. And he has the strength of God. And he's supposed to do it with a smile. He doesn't do this with a stone stoic face. Many Christians going around, I've got the joy of God. You could fool me. It should be I am thrilled with God. And when I am facing persecution, I should be singing. After Paul got beat and he's thrown in jail, he's found in there crying. No, he's found in there singing songs. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Be quiet in there. Okay, no. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The songs that remind us of the character of Jesus Christ. Recall that it is about Him and His glory and His joy. In difficult times, we sing those songs. We sing those songs because we give thanks. The last work. In verse 12, giving thanks to God who has qualified us to be partakers in the inheritance of His saints. God is the one who qualifies us, who determines that you are... You're good enough to go, not because of what you've done, because of what Christ has done. Every person here has been a qualifier of something. All of you have gone into the produce department, and I've, well, I shouldn't say I've seen you, but others have seen you go through and pick up an apple or a fruit, and you look at it, and you squeeze it, and you do all, you smell it, and you do all these kind of things, and you put one back until you find the one, and you go, that's qualified to go to my house. Paul says, you have, given, you have been qualified to go to heaven. 
You have moved, you have been deported, he says. You have been delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed, transferred. You have been deported out of darkness because you are not citizens of this place into a new place, into the kingdom of his beloved son, which is where there's light. That is something to, give, to be thankful for. That is something for us to praise the Father for, in whom we have redemption. I thank God because it is by the blood of Christ that I have been redeemed. I have been purchased from the slave market of sin. And I have the forgiveness of sins. All these things I am able to thank God for. How do I make Christ a priority in my life? We go back to first, do you have the knowledge of him? Do you know his will? Second, that, that knowledge will affect your behavior in your daily walk. And third, it will also change your work habits. It will change the way you lead, lead your life. It will lead to good works, good things. You want to make Christ first? This week, spend more time in the Word of God than you've done before. If you're already reading 20 chapters a day, go to 21. If you're only reading two verses, go to three verses. Know what he wants for you in your life. If you're not praying, endeavor to pray more. Seek his will. Having done that, put it into practice in your daily action. Don't just say, oh, I, knew some, I learned something more. But then when it comes about, I understand his will, say, oh, it's hard to put his will into practice. Yeah, I get that comes to a point where you say, there are things in my life I have to push out because they do not have any priority with the will of God's, that, that God has for me. The old jacket does not need to come on. Don't pick up the old sinful things of life. Leave them. Well, I'm going to pick it up later. But, I, <laughs> but leave the old tattered sin behind. Come get a new one. Show off the new things of Christ. It is a worthy of the character of Jesus. And that will lead to good works. That is Paul's prayer for the believers. And we will look and see how that priority is established in Colossians next week. Christ must be first in our life. Ladies and gentlemen, if we only have three months left on this earth. He must be first. And our goal is going to be, if he is, let's make sure others know about it. Let's pray. Let me follow Lord, we just think that you are a gracious God, a loving God, a God who is full of mercy, a God who loves and cares about each one of us, who desires to see us to be the kind of men and women that you have planned and purposed for us. But Lord, we struggle with sin. Some sins in our life, Lord, have wrapped us up in steel cables and it will not release us. And we've asked for release and it seems like we just fall right back into that pit. So Lord, we're asking again and we want you to come alongside us and we are claiming the blood of Jesus on our lives. We want to know you. And we want to show you. And we want it to start today. Watch over everyone here throughout the week and empower them with your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.